This broadcast of In Focus is being made possible through the support of Reed Health. Reed Health, right beside you. And by First Bank Richmond, with eight locations serving Wayne County. First Bank Richmond and you, doing great things together. And by Morrison Reeves Library, where you can check out an endless variety of movies, binge-worthy TV series, graphic novels, books, games, toys, and CDs. Stream movies and audiobooks with the MRL Digital Library, open 24-7. Visit MRL Downtown Richmond or online at mrlinfo.org. At Reed Health, we are prepared to safely deliver all essential medical care. Delaying treatment for a serious condition, like a heart attack, stroke, or appendicitis, may lead to a different outcome. Don't ignore symptoms, chest pain, rapid breathing, stroke symptoms, severe abdominal pain, the worst headache of your life, confusion and not acting right. We are here for you 24-7. Reed Health has taken many steps to protect you. This is to ensure your safety so Reed can continue providing care when you need it. Reed Health, right beside you. I mean, we couldn't do what we do without First Bank and how supportive they have been throughout the years. I've had a very good experience working with First Bank. They, they have been there really with all kinds of different things that I do in my life. We consider First Bank Richmond a good friend. They're there to help us sponsor our signature events. You always are out there to help each other out. Besides the business part of it, we just get along really well. And it's, it's, it's beyond a working relationship. Hello, I'm Jenny Lahman from Morris and Rees Library. I invite you to come into the library and be inspired. <music> Discover our many programs and services. Join us for a story time. Explore your family's history. Come in and select materials from our books, music, movies, and more. We have an exceptional staff ready to serve you. So come on in and be inspired at MRL. Welcome to this edition of In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of Whitewater Community Television, and thank you very much for joining me for this conversation of In Focus. Before we get there, a couple of things to remind you about. The most important one is that there is still time for you to register to vote, and we urge you to do that. There are races locally, coroner, um, as well as clerk. Um, there's also sixth congressional district race going on, and obviously the governor's race will go. And there is, of course, uh, I don't know, we're electing some guy who lives in a big white house someplace. Um, so be registered. That's what we say. Please do it. If you don't know whether you're registered, you can go to indianavoters.com and check your status. If you aren't registered, want to get registered, you can go to indianavoters.com and get registered. If you want to find out where your polling places are, you can go to indianavoters.com and do that. So from the comfort of your living room couch, using your tablet, your phone, whatever, go to indianavoters.com, check your status, register to vote, find out where you can vote, all of that. We do ask you to do that. It is incredibly important for all of us to, to get that done. Also want to thank our sponsors for this week's program, Read Health, First Bank Richmond, and Morrison Reeves Library. We appreciate greatly their support. I'm very happy to, to have with me Chris Hardy, who um, a little bit earlier this summer gave me some relief um, by sitting in as a guest host. But Chris also has a number of things that he has been doing. We've been hearing his voice um, on his podcast. Also, uh, he's been helping out with um, Hometown Media. I talked to um, Brenda McLean um, a few months ago. She was talking about Chris helping out with their website and making that work. So wanted to have Chris in kind of to debrief, as it were, and figure out what he's doing. So, Chris, thanks for spending some time with us. Greatly appreciate wow. it. Thanks so much for having me, Eric. It's, uh, it's great to be talking with you. 
for those who, who don't know you and, and don't know your background, you're not native to Richmond, are you? You <laughs> found this through your college experience, is that correct? That's right. I, I grew up in Cincinnati and hadn't really heard of Richmond until I showed up to go to Earlham College in 1995. Uh, and, you know, honestly had no intention of staying in Richmond after that college experience. But in the four years that I was an Earlham student and on campus and in the community, um, I really planted some roots here and uh, started to, to call it home. And uh, now when people ask me where I'm from, I say Richmond. Uh, so it's, it's the longest place I've ever lived and it's the place I think of as home. But you're right, I, I am a transplant uh, for all practical purposes, yeah. Talk about, um, because Earlham College is a place that has brought a number of people to town, maybe, maybe more than some of us truly realize. Um, and it's not quite Bloomington um, and that impact. The people that go to Bloomington supposedly are just going there to school and never leave. But, but Earlham has brought some people to town for the experience of going to college and a number of them have stayed. What are some of the attractions, some of the things that attracted you to, to make this home? And, and as we think about some of those people who maybe can work remotely as you have done a lot, Sure. What are some of the things that maybe some of our, our leaders need to be thinking about um, to make this a place where people can live, work remotely, that type of thing? Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, Earl, the size of Earlham and the size of Richmond were very appealing. I, I toured some colleges and universities where I knew that I would be, uh, you know, a, a small, uh, very small fish in a very big pond, you know, with thousands and thousands of people uh, just at the school alone. And so when I came to Earlham and they, you know, they knew my name and they were interested in getting to know me and I, uh, you know, found that my incoming class was small enough to really get to know people and be known, um, that, that was really wonderful. And the same thing sort of translated into Richmond um, when I started, you know, honestly, I was in, I was in the, the campus bubble for the first couple of years, but when I started spending time out in Richmond uh, and seeing, you know, the, the people here, the businesses here, small business community, um, how you could walk down the street and, you know, know a lot of people and have conversations and catch up, but you could also meet new people. It was just like this, this great size where, you know, small enough that you could, you could feel like you were making a difference, um, but big enough that you could have new experiences on a regular basis. And I, I think that has continued to be appealing uh, for me and, and why, you know, my wife and, and I call it home. Um, and I think, you know, so, someone pointed out a number of years ago, like in many ways, Richmond is a college town, right? We have Earlham, we have IU East, we have Purdue, we have the seminaries. And when you put all of the staff and students for all those institutions together, I mean, there's a big part of our, our local sort of day-to-day -day life that's, that centers around higher education. Uh, and that's something I, I think, you know, we can embrace and be proud of and, and celebrate and, and build on as a community. So, um, you know, that, that's something that I've always been excited about. You're right. And I mean, in this kind of pandemic time, you know, we're hearing stories of people fleeing these traditional hubs of knowledge workers and tech workers. You hear about kind of San Francisco and maybe New York City as, you know, people are like, well, if I can work from home, <laughs> why am I going to pay <laughs> so much money for an apartment or a house? Um, sure. And you're right. That's something that the places like Richmond need to think about and seize on. Um, when you think about the implications of some of those larger salaries, um, tech salaries, knowledge worker salaries, um, and what they could mean for disposable income, what they mean for the local tax base, uh, that's something we should we should be thinking about. And it, you know, it's clear, like, we're never going to be able to compete with some of those bigger cities um, when it comes to just the, the features of, you know, the services or restaurants or that kind of thing. But what we can offer, I think, uh, is a, a real focus on quality of life. Um, you know, the, the amount of green space we have, um, the small town feel, the affordability, um, availability of, of housing, that kind of thing. Um, so when, when tech workers now are, are looking at where to live, they're not saying, okay, I need to be in San Francisco. They're saying, I need, where can I go that I can have great quality of life that's affordable, uh, you know, maybe raise a family, maybe start my own small business. Um, so for me, that's things like green space. It's making sure we're a walkable, bikeable community, making sure we're a diverse community, a progressive community. Um, 
that's, yeah, just really inclusive and welcoming um, and affordable uh, for people who might be interested in making that kind of change. We're, we're not going to go um, down, a, down a long political path here. Sure. But, but in that list of things, one of the things you said was a progressive community. Hmm. When you make that statement, some people immediately go political. I don't necessarily. So I'm sure. going to ask, when you say progressive, talk about what that means to you. Yeah, you know, it, it is a term that has a lot of political connotations, um, and I, I don't mean it to, or I don't use it in, in that sense. I use it, I guess, to mean a, a community that is thinking about the future, that's making decisions that will create uh, a life and uh, an environment where, you know, people from all different backgrounds, people from all different experiences can thrive, where uh, small businesses can thrive and large businesses can thrive, uh, and that it's kind of forward looking and, uh, you know, I guess the opposite of progressive might be regressive. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you were a regressive community, you would be trying to keep everything the same. You would be trying to go back to the way things were at some point in time. And, and I think, you know, we've, we've shown that communities that kind of hold on to the past and don't think about the future often don't thrive. Um, so if anything, I, I use it in that context to mean a, a place that's thinking about the future, planning for the future, building for the future, and trying to include as many people as possible in that process uh, along the way. So, yeah. When you talk a little bit about Earlham College, the impact that it had on you, and, and as an alum who continues to remain here, the impact that it has on this community as, as people may not completely know and understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, Earlham uh, as an institution is, uh, has a background that's tied to the, the Quaker uh, tradition. And one of the things I, I didn't know about this coming to Earlham, I, I wasn't raised Quaker. Uh, you know, one of the things I came to really appreciate about it is that a lot of decision making there was done by the process of consensus. So instead of saying, uh, you know, there's one person at the top who makes all the decisions and everyone else just kind of has to live with it. <laughs> uh, instead, you can say, you know, what, what's a decision making process that allows everyone who's going to be affected by a decision to be a part of the conversation. And if you think about the underlying assumption there that, that everyone's voice matters, um, everyone has an opinion or a perspective that should be considered, maybe it's going to turn out that their opinion or perspective isn't a helpful one, but you know, there's still a place for that to be a part of the conversation. And then we, we take all that into the mix and, and move forward. Um, that really, you know, changed a lot of things for me at a fundamental level um, about the way I work, about the way that my um, relationships work, about the, you know, friendships, about small business leadership, about community engagement. Um, because if you, if you start to think that everyone has an opinion or a voice or a perspective that's worth considering, um, that really changes how you do leadership, how you do uh, community building. And so, you know, from the time that I was a student and, and then on to running a business in town, uh, running for office when I did that, being involved in the local not-for-profit community, um, those roots and those, that, that consensus uh, approach to decision-making and conversations um, really has informed a lot of that and cha changed my life for the better. Uh, and I think has changed a lot of people's lives for the better. And, you know, when they're able to bring that out into the world. You just talked about some of the things that you've done here um, yeah. and, and particularly in starting a business. One of the things that is always a concern for people in a community, not just this size, but in all size communities, are we a friendly community for entrepreneurs, for people who want to start a business. You've had a chance to do that from the ground up. Talk about what you see in this community um, in, in that aspect. Are we, are we business friendly? Well, it depends on what kind of business you are, right? Um, you know, if, if you can make something, produce something that you can show, a product you can sell, something that, that is a retail product, people... Um, are a lot more easily able to see uh, the, the value in that and support that as a small business. Um, you know, when, when my co-founder and I, Mark, were starting our business, you know, we were in the knowledge space and the technology space. Uh, 1997 websites, <laughs> you know, were kind of a new thing. And so when we, you know, be around town telling people we were building a website development company, um, you know, they didn't know what to do with that. And we were also, you know, very young. I was 19 at the time. Um, and so, 
you know, two, two young guys saying they're starting a business using the internet, uh, you know, didn't get a lot of traction around town at first because people just didn't know what to make of it. I think obviously, you know, we've come a long way since then. People are a lot more familiar with what's possible, online businesses, tech businesses, knowledge businesses. Um, but in terms of the infrastructure, you know, when we think about economic development, resources in town, when we think about uh, resources that are out there to support um, the startup business world, I, I think we're still probably pretty, pretty geared toward um, people that make things and sell things and have retail storefronts as opposed to some of those knowledge workers. So I think that's a, an area for growth. Um, I, I did find, you know, we found along the way that there were lots of things we had to figure out on our own, uh, just, you know, legal uh, wrangling when it comes to starting a business, finances, uh, you know, leadership structure, benefits, things like that. And so at each step along the way, we kind of had to go out and, and figure that out and, and understand it. Um, and I think when, you know, when a place like the Uptown Innovation Center was created, part of the hope there was that you would have a kind of a hub for uh, resources for sp startup businesses to have all, you know, the answers to those questions in one place. I'm not sure that ever really materialized in the way that we, we hoped it would. And I, again, I think there's still an area for growth there that if, if someone today coming out of IU East or Earlham or just from the community and said, hey, I have an idea for a business and I want to get it going, I think right now they'd still have a pretty tough uphill battle to, to figure out where to go and who to work with. There are people out there, there are great resources out there, but they'd still have a lot to figure out on their own. So I think we can do more there to, to help, help folks get launched when they have a, an idea, uh, get up and running. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We're having a chance to speak with Chris Hardy, um, transplant, um, entrepreneur, student, um, a, a lot of different hats that, that you've worn in your time here. Bef before we kind of walk away from, from the, the tech part of this, one of the things that the pandemic really, I think, has done is, is shown us that the conversation around connectivity um, and our broadband speeds and, and needing better broadband all the way mm -hmm. around um, really has been a lot of talk. I mean, when, when people started trying to work from home and not just here in Richmond, Wayne County or East Central Indiana, but, but you've seen it even nationally as, as people in California, news anchors in Indianapolis have tried to do what we're doing from home. Yeah. You get pixelation, you get dropout, you get even in the large communities that's happening. As somebody who is in the tech world, talk about where you think we need to go, what kind of conversation we need to be having with our legislators or the business community or whatever, because we may get back to something that we remember as normal, but I think there will be more people working from home, obviously more people streaming, more broadband being used. How do we make that stronger, more robust, and move us to the 21st century? Because we're obviously yeah. not there yet. Yeah. I mean, it's funny if you think even just 10 years ago, I think having a, a high speed internet connection at home was kind of seen as a luxury item. I mean, it was, it was nice uh, to have, but, but by no means could we have imagined, you know, then uh, what we're experiencing now that, you know, having a connection at home and a quiet space to work could make all the difference in, you know, your, your quality of life for, for your work. If you're, you know, someone who uh, is, is in an industry or working for a job where, you know, that, that possibility exists. Um, I think it's really brought to light the digital divide. You know, not everyone has reliable access to the internet. Not everyone has devices at home that are their own to use. You know, sometimes, mul you know, multiple kids, families sharing one computer, one device. Um, and, and that's something that's now just very real in terms of its impact on someone's ability to have a great education, you know, when something like a pandemic hits. Um, I think people are still figuring out the difference between the kind of frantic uh, working from home during a pandemic mode <laughs> and then the actual like remote work that is planned out that is, um, you know, thoughtfully done where, you know, you feel supported and collaborative uh, with your employer, or your colleagues in, in that environment. I mean, a lot of people are still working in the kind of reactive, uh, reacting to a crisis mode. And so I think we have some work to do there to help, you know, organizations figure out how to do that well and uh, what leadership and accountability and transparency and, you know, performance uh, reviews and all those things look like in a, in a distributed environment. 
Um, yeah, and I, I mean, a distraction-free home office is is a rarity. I don't think we should uh, take that for granted, shouldn't assume everyone has one. So as you said, I mean, internet connectivity is more important than ever. Um, having more choices and speed options, I think is important. I think, you know, we'll come to see internet access as more of a utility than a, than a, uh, you know, extra or a luxury item. And um, I think we need to make sure that um, the companies that are providing those services, uh, you know, realize <laughs> the role that they're playing now. And, you know, I, I think for the most part, things have been smooth when it comes to local uh, connectivity, but it, you know, you think about if one of those providers had had a major outage or if hadn't hadn't been ready in terms of infra infrastructure, you know, that in itself could put a place like Richmond uh, way behind other other cities, other communities. Um, sure. So I think there's still room there for better tools, um, communication tools, collaboration tools. Uh, you know, I've talked some about the value of having a co-working space where people who are knowledge workers or work from home primarily could go to have a, a temporary desk or a temporary office space to kind of get out of um, their home office environment. And I think that's still something that would be a benefit in Richmond. Um, the Innovation Center has offered a, a version of that at times, um, but in terms of a, a sort of real co-working space, I think that's something we could still pursue um, yeah, and I, th I think there's more incentives we could be offering to companies uh, in the area that want to, um, you know, transition their workforce to a distributed setup, you know, resources we could be offering, incentives we could be offering to help them do that so that if, if the choice is to have to scale back business or go out of business or to make that transition, I think we could be doing a lot to help our, our local businesses uh, work, work on that. So there, there's a ton there <laughs> to, to do and to think about. Um, but yeah, certainly getting everyone access and devices at home is a, is a good first step so that we have that, that kind of uh, even landscape for everybody. I know you're not a, a, a lawyer or a tax advisor, but one of the things you talked about was was incentives for businesses to do things. Is it, are we at a point in your mind, and again, as someone who has worked remotely, where we need to relook at our tax code because we're having individuals have to leave an office, create a space in their home, and you talked about it—a quiet workspace in their home that maybe wasn't originally there. Yeah. So do we need to re have our our legislators? relook at our tax code so that not all of that benefit goes to business. And this is not an anti-business statement, but understand that there are people who are assuming some of that responsibility on their own and, and maybe not needing to do that. The same way things have been done in state code for teachers, because we know that teachers have had to put out their own money for things that they need. Right. Right. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's one of those things, my, my best understanding is that, you know, at the, at the IRS level, the national level, you know, you can say, you know, I use this part of my house for my work. Um, but there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through to kind of prove and show that you are using that space exclusively for business purposes. And it's not a mixed use of, you know, sometimes you're watching Netflix and sometimes you're doing work. And I think for a lot of people that that's just not a you know, a level of detail that they're able to, to document or prove, or they don't want to take the time to go into that. So I think there are things that could be done there to make that an easier distinction, uh, an easier box to check on your, you know, your annual uh, federal filing. Um, I know a lot of businesses now are relying on, on people's home internet connections and their personal cell phones to stay in touch. Um, but a lot of businesses don't have a way to to pay for that as a, as a benefit, you know, an employment benefit to all of a sudden mm -hmm. take on, you know, cable and phone bills for all of their employees. So uh, there's probably something there that could uh, either make that, you know, a tax benefit or a tax credit of some kind, or uh, either support the business or the individual. Um, there's just lots of little things like that, that, you know, over time really add up because if you, you know, that could be hundreds of dollars a month, depending on your, uh, you, you know, your home setup. So when we're coming to rely on those things, we should look at them as more essential services that, that could be baked in more to the tax code as, as uh, possible credits or reductions. Yeah. You're watching In Focus on WGTV Channel 11. We're spending some time with Chris Hardy, who um, has been doing some work for a number of months with, with Hometown Media, um, which kind of falls into some other things that, that you've been doing. You've had your own podcast. Um, you've had your own, your own space, Richmond Matters, 47374. Talk a little bit about, uh, first, what kind of got you into the idea of needing to share information with people. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. um, on your own. And, and you've done it to the point where you believe people should be connected. So you even kind of created this space where you were pulling news reports and information from various people so that they could even get that information in one place. Yeah, um, I can talk a lot about the different projects I've tackled. I guess I've always been fascinated with where people get their information and how people get their information, um, just what the what the tools are that people use, what systems are out there, what channels they follow. Um, that that's kind of been my professional life as a I mean as a software engineer, as a web developer, someone who's worked on marketing, uh, consulting. Um, just thinking about what tools and sites and online uh, presence uh, are going to help everyone, you know, do what they're trying to do in the world, whether you know that's in a professional setting or a personal setting. Um, I think in the last decade, I mean, I've I've come, and I think a lot of us have come to see access to information as um, much more critical at the level of civic engagement and the health of democracy, the health of communities. Um, where the habits and, and patterns of information consumption uh, can really determine like how well a given neighborhood or a community or a city is going to thrive. Um, I certainly saw it while I was running for office. I ran for city council back in 2011. Um, I saw, you know, while building a business and trying to grow that business, market that business in the community. Uh, I saw it while I've been a part of, you know, local not-for-profit organizations that are trying to get the word out about their programs, uh, their activities, their need for fundraising, uh, you know, the, the kind of day-to-day -day decisions about like where, where do people get their info, where do they find out about community events, it really matters and it can make or break, you know, a certain concept or a certain vision for community building. So I, I guess I've always tried to figure out uh, where I can make a difference in that and bring my skills to bear for the benefit of the communities I care about, whether it's locally um, here in Richmond or, or otherwise. Uh, and that's kind of led me to, to, you know, try experimenting, I guess, with different tools over the years. I mean, I've always been a blogger. I've always been commenting, writing, observing online and sharing, you know, what I, what I see in, in the world and in the community. Uh, you mentioned the site 47374.info. Uh, for me that, I mean, some of that came out of some, some Facebook uh, curmudgeon <laughs> uh, in me where it was like, I, I didn't like the feeling I had after spending time on Facebook of, uh, having to wade through uh, cat photos, political opinions, you know, really serious personal updates and like trying to understand like what's happening in the world in, in that sort of chaos. And so, uh, you know, I, I deactivated my Facebook account a long time ago and uh, thought, Jealous. okay, <laughs> hey, you should try it. Uh, and but still wanted to be engaged and involved with like what's happening in the community. So I built 47374.info to pull together, you know, the, the publicly available information out there, whether it's from local newspapers, press releases, um, publicly available Facebook pages, um, news sites, blogs, and kind of put it all in one place. And so I can, I can go there throughout the day and see what's being published about the community. Um, there's also like a daily email you can sign up for. It's not a commercial venture. I don't make any money on it. Uh, you know, I, I want to be clear about that because I'm, you know, it's, it's built on top of the work that other people are doing to, to write about and report on what's happening in the community. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, it's, it's been a helpful resource. There's about 120 people who get that daily email and, and read about what's going on in the community through that channel. So, so I feel good that, you know, I, I created something that was useful for people uh, who, you know, want to, want to stay involved without wading through <laughs> what's on Facebook sometimes. Um, yeah, I have a blog at richmondmatters.com. Um, I've tried various other projects in the community. Some of them are, you know, I, I think one time I was like, okay, I'm going to create a live chat for Richmond, Indiana, where people can go online and chat with each other. And that it was kind of pre-Facebook days. Um, it didn't really take off. There was, I think the Primex Plastics fire was the <laughs> one time where all of a sudden like 200 people were on it and were sharing information about, you know, what streets were closed and, uh, you know, what the fire department was doing. And then after that, it just got quiet again. So, you know, different experiments. I'm, I'm happy to have things uh, succeed or fail. And it's, you know, it's good information to learn about, uh, again, where people get their news and what's happening. You decided to kind of wade in and, and provide some assistance with hometown media. What was your interest there um, in, in helping build that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm working, I'm, I should say I'm volunteering as a consulting digital editor for Hometown Media Group. And, uh, you know, I, I saw them when I became aware of them and I saw the ways in which they were 
continuing to try to provide uh, local news, local journalism that was grounded in the community um, where the editorial decisions were being made, you know, locally. And, um, you know, as we've seen other larger um, publications struggle with coverage or with budget cuts, um, you know, lo local news and local journalism, I, I think just remains really essential. And so I reached out to them and said, you know, how, how can I help? <laughs> and at first they were like, who is this guy and what, <laughs> what does he want from us? Um, but I think once they realized that I was, you know, genuinely offering to, to you know, help uh, build on what they had already done, um, we had some really great conversations. And so over the last um, six months or so, you know, I've been able to help them update their online presence, uh, think about their digital strategy, think about their subscription model, think about um, how they engage with their readers. And yeah, just really focus on modernizing their online strategy and tools. Um, for me, I, I think one thing we may or may not have mentioned yet is I'm, I'm also a graduate um, student at Ball State studying journalism. And so it's been a really neat opportunity to put some of what I've been learning there uh, and apply it to a, a real world situation. And it's been great to see how you know, some of the, where the ideals of journalism uh, meet the, <laughs> real, the realities of you know, a small town print newspaper. Um, <laughs> But it's been, it's been great. And, you know, I've been able to bring just sort of a mix of my small business and local and online uh, publishing and media experience to bear. And um, we've been able to do some neat things together. And they, you know, as, as an organization, they're just, they're growing, they're looking for uh, new ways to serve the community and, and make sure that, uh, again, people who want to get the word out about important things happening here can do that. And people who want to read about it can, can do that. So uh, it's been, it's been really rewarding to be a part of that. Talked about being a, a journalism student, and I, we hadn't mentioned it yet. I was yeah. too, so good lead in. As as a person who has is is now studying journalism, and as a person who has put your opinion out there, mm -hmm. and knowing that those two things are not the same, how do you find yourself in that space? Because in in my mind, that's a space that has really kind of been muddied. Yep. over the last decade or more where we think people are journalists, but they're really not. They're just opinion people. And, and there's a different ethic when it right. comes to being an opinion person and being a journalist. Yeah. And, and I think uh, we can never do too much community education about that distinction. Um, with the writing I've done, the blogging I've done, I mean, I've, I've always been careful. I've never tried to represent myself as a journalist or as someone who is providing a um, objective uh, coverage of a topic. Um, I, I've always, you know, shown that the, what I'm offering is my opinion or my observations. Um, and I think because people still get those things confused, we, we just have to say that, you know, we have to make those distinctions really uh, carefully. Um, there's a national organization called the Trust Project that is trying to help people, you know, when they go read something online, when they go read an article, um, that's trying to show some of the the signals or the indicators that that help you make those distinctions. So, you know, is this something that that has uh, multiple sources or is it just one person's opinion? Is this something that's been fact checked? Uh, is this something where the reporter or the publication involved is receiving sponsorship dollars from an entity that, that's being reported on, you know, things like that, that might be conflicts of interest. So um, asking people to care about those details and pay attention to them when they're reading something online, um, you know, I, I think in the past it's been kind of taken as a given, uh, but I don't think we can anymore. And, and when something is shared on Facebook and, and becomes viral and becomes a, you know, a widely read piece about politics or healthcare or whatever it is, um, you know, I, I hope that people are taking the time to say, okay, is, is what I'm reading uh, propaganda? Is it an opinion piece or is it something that's been reported in a journalistic context? Um, if, if we can't make that distinction, we're in real trouble because the kind of foundations of figuring out, you know, what's true, what's, what's based on science, what's based on fact uh, is something we're struggling with <laughs> as a, as a country. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I try to be really careful about that and everything I do, but I, I think it's often also up to the reader and up to, um, you know, all anyone out there who's sharing something or, or publicizing something that, you know, we, we have to try to help make those distinctions. Um, and I think there's more work to be done even just in Richmond about educating people along, along those lines. Cause there, there are times where we've had people who, 
um, are seen as journalistic sources of information uh, who then cross over in, into the opinion area or have conflicts of interest. And that's not always been disclosed. And I think that can be really confusing. Um, so we just have to be really careful about it. Uh, and, and I know exactly what you're talking about. We've had conversations. I've had conversations with other community members who have suggested that, that Whitewater Community Television should have a newscast mm -hmm. um, in the evenings. And, and my pushback has been, we're not a journalistic organization. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I've kind of taken on the role of being the question person, but I don't have a degree in journalism. I did not study journalism. Um, so I don't consider myself to be a journalist and, and no one on my staff is. So we try to be very careful with how those things are, are presented. Um, yeah. So uh, it is important that, that I think people look at where that information is coming from and what it really is. Yeah. And I mean, because I started as a, as a blogger, I mean, I, I don't want to devalue, you know, if there's someone out there who's able to show up at a city council meeting and say, you know, here, here's what I saw, here's what happened, here's what was said. And they put that on their blog. I mean, I don't, I don't think that just because they don't have a, a degree in journalism or have, you know, been a part of a journalistic organization, I don't, I don't think that means that doesn't have value. Um, we just have to be careful to, to draw those lines and say, okay, this is, this is someone who is showing up as a, as a blogger, as a writer and offering their perspective. That's still very different from a, a news report about, you know, what, what unfolded. Um, so I think, you know, I think our community could use more of all of it. <laughs> I think WCTV plays a great role in that and as a public media organization and creating a space uh, for people to have a voice and to share their perspectives, share their observations and even offer, you know, valuable information about what's happening in the community. Still not the same thing as a newscast, but that's, you know, that's a, a valuable service in itself too. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm glad that you all <laughs> do what you do in the ways that you do it. Thank you. We enjoy what we do. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We're spending some time with Chris Hardy. Thanks to our sponsors for this program, Morrison Reeves Library, uh, First Bank Richmond, and Reed Health. Um, I, I kind of asked you to step into this space um, over a period of time and have even suggested that you could step into the space a little bit more often. Um, but, but talk a little bit about the conversations that you had um, surrounding particularly racial justice, um, yeah. social justice over that three week period. Um, you talked to a professor, you talked to the police chief, you talked to uh, Bill Engel, a current uh, Richmond Common Council member and, and a journalist with the Palladium Item who had covered government. Talk about how those conversations went for you. Did you learn anything new? Did it change your mind about anything that you were feeling? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they were, they were um, meaningful conversations. They were hard conversations. And I was glad to have them, but I was, I was, you know, tired <laughs> by them. And I, you know, to, to say that as a, uh, uh, you know, privileged white male who, you know, got to, you know, swoop in, do those conversations, and then I could turn off Zoom and move on with my day, you know, gave me new appreciation for, people um, who are working on the challenges of systemic racism all day, every day, um, people who are subject to them, people who are, um, you know, affected by it. And it's, um, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's everywhere in the landscape of our country and our community and to bring it sort of intentionally onto a TV show and have a conversation about it. Um, you know, it was hard and it felt like, you know, literally like the very least I could do <laughs> um, to, to help keep the conversation going forward. So, I, I mean, thank you again for that opportunity. I, I mean, I think what I learned is that um, we have we have so much work to do and so many conversations to have as a, as a community. Um, you know, even calling back to earlier in this conversation, like taking a word like progressive and you can hear how someone sees it through a lens of politics or someone sees it to, to mean something. And so even just saying the word like racism or systemic racism or white privilege or any of those phrases, um, they can mean so many different things to, to different people and they can, they can pull up, they can trigger um, very strong associations. And if we're going to make progress on, on these topics, like we have to be able to confront those things ourselves. We have to be able to say like, what, what is it that this calls up for me? What are my biases, what are the things that I thought I knew were true that I didn't actually know or that I need to learn more about. Um, and I, I hope, you know, I hope that those conversations contributed to that. Uh, 
I think, you know, through all, through all of those interviews and conversations and through my other, um, you know, interviews on my podcast, I mean, I, I continue to see that, that Richmond and Wayne County uh, is largely a community um, full of, you know, kind and forward thinking and generous people. Um, as I said before, we kind of live at a scale where we can care about other people in our community. We can, uh, we can see them, we can hear them, we can listen to them, and we can adapt and adjust our, uh, our opinions to, to what we learn. Um, and just that feeling of like, we can shape and choose what kind of community we want to be. Like i I feel that sense of optimism that, uh, even with something as hard and as challenging and as ingrained as racism, like we can, we can still work on it. We can still make progress on it if we want to. Um, and it, you know, some of the people I talk to and, and others out there, I mean, I've, I've learned that people who are getting things done here are, um, people who are looking at where there's a need, um, where there's maybe a, a, an area of pain, uh, where there's an opportunity, and they're pursuing it with, with passion and creativity, whether that's in the classroom or in municipal government or uh, in you know, any, like starting a march, starting a protest, whatever it is, um, they're not focused on being right or being popular. <laughs> you know, they're, they're focused on like figuring out what's, what's happening in the world and, and doing what they do at a level of quality and, and kind of intentionality that, that really matters. So that meant a lot to see that in action, to see that in those conversations. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have a lot of challenges. We, we haven't figured out racism. We haven't figured out, you know, what's a sustainable economy for our area that, that lifts everyone up. We haven't figured out um, addiction or poverty or, abuse or misogyny. I mean, there's all, there's all sorts of challenges facing us. And I think the things that I still see getting in our way, um, you know, frag fragmented efforts when people are working on similar goals, but are doing it off kind of on their own, like we're, mm -hmm. we're not a big enough community that we can afford to do that. <laughs> so we, we need people to work together more, not duplicate each other's efforts. Um, you know, historically, I think we've been kind of study happy, um, it's, it's easy to commission a study about something and wait a couple months and get a report and then say that progress has been made. And I, I just don't think we can afford to do that in most areas. Um, I think we wrestle with, with avoiding conflict. I mean, I, I think just as humans, like it's not always easy to go toward something that's hard where it might feel like we're being attacked or being, you know, having our personal views criticized and we have to figure out ways around that. So, um, so I think we get we get hung up on some of those things and we get hung up on people who are always saying, you know, negative things on Facebook or otherwise. Um, but I, I, I saw in those conversations and in, you know, other conversations that there's there's progress to be made, there's opportunities, there are people who care and who are working on it. Um, we just have to keep working on it and not not slow down. So a couple of questions to to kind of follow up. You use yeah. the term pretty early, um, white privilege. Yeah. For, for some people, um, that, that term is nails on a chalkboard. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and they hear it and it's an immediate turnoff. I asked you earlier to talk about the context of the word progressive when you used mm -hmm. it. Talk about your definition of, of white privilege. When you say that, when you acknowledge in your mind that you're a person of white privilege, what is it that you see? Yeah. Well, and, and it came up some in my conversation with, with Betsy Schleybach. Uh, uh, so I would tell people to watch that too, because there was a helpful uh, deep dive there. But for me, uh, it's the idea that throughout my life, um, because uh, of my whiteness and because of my you know, background and, and uh, everything that goes with that, you know, there have been opportunities afforded to me, doors opened for me that I didn't even realize <laughs> sometimes were being opened or offered because uh, of the color of my skin and just how I look in the world. Um, and that those same opportunities, those same doors are not offered or opened for people who have a different color skin, uh, people of color in, in any form. And, and that that is something built into um, kind of the long history of, of our, our culture and our country. Um, and the reason it's important to talk about is because uh, if as a white person, I say, well, I, you know, I'm not racist. And so I, I don't understand, you know, why um, I have to care too much about, <laughs> you know, this whole Black Lives Matter movement or whatever it is like I'm, yeah, I'm white, but I'm not racist. Um, 
I, th- I think that misses the point that there are, there are things about our, our very existence and upbringing and, and history that are a part of all of the systems of racism that are out there and that we either knowingly or unknowingly have, have been a part of. Um, it's not, it's not something, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to summarize it here, but it's not something that's I think easily summarized. Um, and there are lots of, you know, books and videos and resources and workshops out there that can, can kind of help dive into it. Um, but talking about white privilege doesn't mean that white people uh, are inherently <laughs> bad or inherently can't be a part of the solution to, to racism. It just means that we have to, to look harder at the role we play uh, and the role we've played in the past in perpetuating some of the systems that, that make racism possible. As you've done some research um, and, and talked to different people, I'm going to ask you to do one more of those. When you hear the term Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. what does that say to you in your space? Yeah. <clears throat> I think to me it, it, it says that uh, in the world we live in, in this moment in time, um, we, we have not been a society that has held black lives to matter as much as white lives. And that that has resulted in violence, in incarceration, in oppression, in all sorts of problems for black people and people of color. And that as a society, um, it's long past time for us to confront that. And by saying black lives matter, we can say, whereas in the past we have not, we have not pursued that level of equality and justice for everyone. Um, by saying it now, we're saying it's, it's time, it's past time to, to pursue that. Um, you know, people often make the analogy that if, if you were uh, in a neighborhood and a house was, was burning um, and you were trying to get everybody out, you know, to, to yell, well, everyone's lives on this street matter, not just the people in this house. Uh, you know, you might look at them funny because the, the house that's on fire is the one that you need to care about in that moment and that you need to do something about. And so, you know, I think, I think black lives matter is saying, Hey, this, this, this thing's on fire (laughs) and we need, we need to put our attention here and we need to do something about it. Um, Yes. All, all lives matter is, is true as well. And they can both be true. um, But it's a statement that makes a difference in this moment in time. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We're spending some time with Chris Hardy, um, entrepreneur, um, person who is involved with uh, and has been involved with a number of not-for-profit organizations providing volunteer work, providing some advice, um, and and who is, like me, a a transplant to this community, had a chance to see it um, on on a different level. Uh, We've got about 10 minutes left to go in the show. I also want to thank our our sponsors for this program, um, First Bank Richmond, Reed Health, and Morrison Reed's Library. We appreciate their support. I I said at the end, when I invited you to do this, I don't don't do this very often to people. I I kind of value my place as, as the question person and never having to provide an opinion. Uh (laughs) Um, But because you were kind enough to step in and, and, and ask questions of people, I said, I would give you a chance if there were a couple of questions that you wanted to throw my way that I might ask and no, none of my other guests will get this opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So so I'm curious whether there is anything that you came up with and, and if there is, it better be a real softball. (laughs) Let's see, favorite ice cream flavor? No. Um, well, you know, we've talked a little bit about where people get their information. And I think public media like WCTV has st- historically played like a really central role in people learning about and, and connecting to their communities. So, I mean, as, um, and, and especially I should say like maybe the less mainstream parts, the parts that aren't always covered in the news, more fringe parts of a community have been able to be represented. So, so now that we're in this age of like Facebook and other social media where everything is, is shared all the time, do you, do you see the role of, of public media and community television shifting uh, in that context? Um, I, I don't know that it is in, in my mind. Now, there are others who have been um, around community media um, mm-hmm. a lot longer than me. Um, I, I think what we are able to do is, is provide a place 
for people to, to share their thoughts. And I don't know that in that way it's changing. I think it is maybe becoming um, more noticed by people and yeah. they are thinking about how they get their voice out a little bit more. Um, and so they are finding spaces like ours um, that still exist. And I say that because there have been through the years attempts um, on, a, on a local and statewide level to, to kind of silence community media to a certain mm -hmm. extent, um, to cut down on the ability of, of people to have a place for their opinion yeah. to be widespread. They, they want to make that in as small a space as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but community media allows that to continue to open. In Connersville, just, just south of us, um, where they have one channel, not three, CTV3, um, who we share programming back and forth with. They've got a program that, that started um, in, in the wake of, of some of the civil unrest at this point in time uh, called A Black Man in a Small Community. Huh. Um, so, it is, so it is programs like that where people in communities are able to share their voices. And I think when, when that unrest, when, when that conversation continues to come up, I think people look for an outlet. So I think community media, places like WCTV, CTV3, and others around the state um, are maybe being noticed a bit more in their communities. Yeah. I don't know what they're changing. What, we're, what is changing is that we're having to think more consciously about putting the information that we collect in more places. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started almost 11 years ago as, as executive uh, director of Whitewater Community Television, we didn't have a YouTube page. We didn't have a Facebook page. Um, we weren't sharing on WGTV online, which is a place where you can go and see full government meetings. We didn't have all of those social media spaces, but it, it has made us think about using those places to put that community information out a little bit more so it is more acceptable um, and easier to, to access for folks. Yeah. Do I have time for a follow-up? Sure. <laughs> Do you see people as willing to change their minds anymore as the result of a conversation or an interview or a program that WCTV has been a part of, or are we uh, collectively still pretty tribal and kind of set in our ways, uh, even when we're theoretically having a conversation about something? I think generally speaking, generally speaking, we're still tribal mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, there's still a lot of people who say, I can't vote for a Democrat, I can't vote for a Republican, without really finding out what that person feels and yeah. believes. Um, I think as a people, we still vote against our interests a lot yeah. because we want to vote for someone who looks like us or has a certain initial behind their name, again, whether their values completely reflect us or not. Mm -hmm. um, but I, have, I will say that, that in my time in, in doing particularly this program um, and even the Ask the Doctors program that, that we've been doing with, with Dr. Huth and Dr. Jetmore during this time of the pandemic, there have been people who have said, you know, I learned something. I, I heard a question and I hadn't thought about it in that way. So I think we are a community that is still trying to grow, trying to develop. There are many people in the community who are trying to, and I'll use the word that you used earlier in the show, trying to be progressive, trying to look forward. I think part of that may be there are a number of people, a, a lot more than we know, like you and I, who mm -hmm. didn't grow up here, who found this place um, through our travels, through coming for school, through coming for work, who have decided to make this home and who really do want to make this as good a place as we possibly can. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I lament the fact that I've got two daughters, neither of which now live here. Um, yeah. but my, my oldest who did live here moved back to Indianapolis just a few weeks ago. So I think there are more of us who would like this space to be more comfortable for our kids so that we can keep them a little bit closer um, than what they are. Mm -hmm. And we know that that means being willing to make some change and think about some things differently. 
Absolutely. That's great. Um, we are coming to the, the end of this. I, I want to give you a minute um, or so because you've gone through a lot. You do have your opinions. You do have your thoughts about a lot of things. Um, so I just kind of want to open up a space to you and say, you've got about 90 seconds. What do you want to say to Richmond, Wayne County, whoever may be watching? Uh, well, I won't pass up the opportunity to encourage people, as you did at the beginning, to vote uh, in the upcoming election. Um, as I said, I, I mean, I ran for office. I know the difference that a few votes can make. I, I lost my own bid by about 200 votes. So that's, you know, in Richmond, that's probably a couple of neighborhoods. Um, I get that it's hard for people sometimes to feel like the effort to vote has the level of importance that we hear about. Um, but I do think it's literally like one of the most basic and critical first steps that people can take with engaging, you know, all the decisions and opportunities that are in front of us. Um, I think it's how we begin to translate uh, our values and our opinions and all the conversations that we're having with friends and neighbors. It's how we translate those into action that, that can really matter. Um, and the people we put in office, um, you know, they're not the only ones who are shaping our future, um, but they are doing it every day. <laughs> and we have to make sure that we have a, a say in that process. So, um, even if you don't see an ideal candidate, uh, even if you're feeling uh, disillusioned about politics in general, uh, it's so important to vote. And I, I hope that everyone who's watching this will do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Chris Hardy with us today. If you missed any of this conversation, replays of the show air tonight, Thursday night at 1030, Fridays at 8 p.m., Saturdays at 8 a.m. and 9 p.m., Sundays at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m., Audio replays of this program can be heard on 1490 AM and 100.9 FM, ESPN Radio, WKBV, and their sister station, G1013, Sundays at 6 AM. You can also see replays of this program on WGTV online. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, please get registered to vote. If It's very easy to find out whether you are registered to vote, where your voting places are, or you can even register all online from the comfort of your home, indianavoters.com is the place to be able to do that, indianavoters.com. And if you are thinking about um, voting absentee, we do suggest that you do it early. Reach out to the Wayne County Clerk's Office. You can find that information uh, very easily on the Wayne County site um, and, and request your absentee ballot. Thank you for watching this week's In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. As always, I wish you well. This broadcast of In Focus is being made possible through the support of Reed Health. Reed Health, right beside you. And by First Bank Richmond, with eight locations serving Wayne County. First Bank Richmond and you, doing great things together. And by Morrison Reeves Library, where you can check out an endless variety of movies, binge-worthy TV series, graphic novels, books, games, toys, and CDs. Stream movies and audiobooks with the MRL Digital Library, open 24-7. Visit MRL Downtown Richmond or online at mrlinfo.org.